Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting with you live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. I got it all the way out. I didn't make a mistake. Yay! And I'm here in the studio with Dana Hawkinson, Dr. Hawkeye. Welcome hey, back, I'm man. Back. How are you? I'm good. You look relaxed. You look like you slept a little. I slept a little bit in my own bed last night, which was good. You know, certainly out in the, the wilderness, it's a little bit hard on the little mattresses. But, uh, you know, over, overall, it's good. It was a good trip. Continue to practice safe uh, practices, hand hygiene, mask wearing, all that stuff. And so that made it a lot better. Good. Thank you. And thanks for being back. Hawkeye is back just as I'm going to be taking a little leave. I'll be gone next week. Jessica Lavelle will be here in the studio working with uh, Hawkeye and some a bunch of great guests. I looked at the lineup, but I have to tell you, I'm a little jealous. So I would love to have, be here next week because it looks so darn good. Yeah. But this week... How are the numbers this morning? Yeah, so the numbers actually have gone down the last couple of days, the averages. Um, we are at 19 today. However, Yay. half of those are in the ICU, critical yeah. care, and six of those needing ventilators. We did have um, four discharges, but still three admissions. And so that's really the problem is even though we are having discharges, we are having about the same amount or sometimes even more admissions from the disease. You know, and the numbers that keep going up dramatically every day, and yeah. we set new records the yeah. last two days for the number of new tests positive here in the United States. Talk to us a little bit about that, Dana. What's going on out there? You know, I mean, from the best evidence that we have, it's just people who are um, not doing best practices. They are continuing to have gatherings, going to, you know, confined areas, bars, restaurants. I think it's really just a, a, a matter of really personal responsibility and not taking that and not believing that it's out there. But now, I think even more than, say, March and February, we are seeing more concerns about surge problems and um, lack of ventilators and hospital rooms around the nation, especially in the South. You know, I think Texas is being particularly hard hit as well. We know Florida, there's a lot of cases there um, in certain areas especially. So I think it's just a matter of people either not wanting to understand and believe that it's out there um, or just unaware. And um, I think it, it continues to be important for everybody to really to wear the mask. And we have to reestablish that the mask, we, we get questions all the time about masks. Will it, should I go there if, um, um, if I can't wear a mask? Again, the mask is for other people, to be considerate of other people in case you have the disease, to decrease your spread. Now, if you're wearing a, a cloth face mask, that could certainly offer some protection. But we really need um, everybody to be wearing the mask because we sometimes don't know if we're sick and able to spread the disease. Yeah, so important because young people, that 20 to 40 year age range has turned out to be a critical age mm -hmm. range. Our f initial part of this whole surge, whether we're in the first or second surge, is irrelevant, right. honestly. It's just we're getting more cases. And when we first had them, we thought, okay, it's going to be in the nursing homes. And then it became yeah. the meatpacking plants and churches. And now what we're seeing is it's back to the bars and small gatherings of people who are coming together and even in a home and, and, and you may have a birthday party or an engagement party mm -hmm. and suddenly half of the people at the engagement party are turning up with yeah. coronavirus. There's a report from Florida, 16 young women went out together, 16 people have coronavirus. Yeah. You know, and the problem is that if the, if the case fatality rate is around 1%, if you know 100 people mm -hmm. um, that get it, then all of a sudden one of them won't be there. And, and that's a tough, tough number. Right. And we're seeing it even in the younger folks. Talk about, I don't know if you know, I know the age range. I think up in the ICU, it's like 29 to 63 right now. Yes. And before, our age was like 60 to 90. Right. So now we've totally flipped. And it went 29, 63, lots of people of Latino descent. Mm -hmm. all, and a lot of those folks have been first-line workers, unable to stay home and living in places where there's a multi-generational family. So what you really have to be cognizant of is that this disease can affect all people, right. all ages. One of the things the disease did, it prevented people from being able to do blood drives. This morning, Jessica's over at a, a blood drive that's right here on our own campus. I know there's a lot of important information today, Jess, because we were really, really short on blood, down to two-day supply, which is a critical supply if you're a surgeon or you're a critically ill patient or you're in a trauma room. That, that's not a great number. The community blood banks worked so hard to get it higher. How are things going? 
hey, Dr. Sykes, good morning. Um, so yeah, this is a time when we want the numbers to be high, and they are this morning. So I've, um, I've brought in Ryan Go uh, Gove. He is the Director of Student Life here at the university, and he's been doing these and putting these on for 13 years, right? Absolutely. So I'm gonna let you do the honors and share with us the numbers over the last couple of days. Thank you, no, it's been great because we had a goal of 130 units over the last two days, and we've had 163. So definitely above our goal. The great number is that 43 people are first time donors, which we always need new first time donors. Um, today we have 90 appointments, which is great on a goal of 65. So I feel like if we if we get there, we might hit 250 total, which would be amazing for the Community Blood Center. Are you surprised by these numbers? Because we know not everyone's back on campus, so you weren't expecting as many, but, but you're really happy with these numbers, right? Absolutely. I think now that we're getting a few people back on campus, um, we've definitely got the numbers up, and being able to, for the community to come down and donate as well has definitely helped. Okay, so today is the last day of this three-day drive. Yes. If people want to donate today, where do they go? How do they, what do they need to know before they come down? Um, you can just go to the Community Blood Center's um, website, um, look for drives today, and you'll see University of Kansas uh, Medical Center. Um, and then definitely check out whether or not you're eligible to donate um, based on the, the COVID questions as well as their normal questions as well. Um, if you're out and about in town, we're sitting right here on the corner of 39th and Rainbow, big glass building. Stop on in, um, donate some blood. Can't miss it. And you said if um, it, people can walk in as as long as the capacity is safe and allowed. Absolutely, so. yeah. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. And coming up, sure. Dr. Sykes, we're going to uh, take some questions from our community viewers. So we'll have those coming up in just a little bit. All right, thanks, Jess. And that's a really big deal. I know the blood bank has gotten more blood yeah. coming in. They're really excited about that. So we said it before, BKC, and you've done that. Thanks and from all of us in the medical profession. We really thank you. It is such an important thing, the gift of life. Well. Jill, how are we doing this morning? First of all, let's see if there's any questions from media. Uh, that was our own guy saying, uh, I think. Logan, was that you saying, uh? Do we have a media question? And I think also as we're waiting, you know, back to your point, talking about the age range, the 29 to 66 year old in the ICU, we should mention, and we've talked about this before, the youngest person on that age range, the 29-year-old, has critical disease and is on the ventilator. But even in the hospital, we're seeing patients as young as 24. So yes, luckily, uh, younger people aren't the predominant people getting ill and having severe illness. But any time you get this, you, you really kind of roll the dice because we just don't know. There probably are very minute microgenetic components to all this and the inflammatory dysregulation and all that. You know, we haven't really teased that out at this point in time. Everybody continues to be susceptible, and everybody is susceptible in one form or another uh, to severe disease and critical illness, and that's it, the important thing to It remember. really is, and, and you just have to follow the pillars of infection control. So yesterday, or last night, I was taking my dog for a walk, and as I took my dog for a walk, I was sitting there, I've got to find a better way to describe how important it is to wear a mask and what a bad decision it is to not. So sometime today, You'll have to figure that out when I'm going to do it. I'm going to get this new example in. We'll see how that works. <laughs> hey, we, we do know there was a question that had rolled in, I think, from some of the media folks, Jill. We yeah. do. KCTV5 wants to know, how effective is UV light in killing the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. This reporter has witnessed some restaurants using mm -hmm. it as people are coming and going. I, mean, I would have thought it was a flashing neon light and I was supposed to right. disco dance. Right. Nobody no. wants to see me do that. No either. club dancing. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no club for, for Dr. Stites. Yeah, you know, we know UV light is very effective. Um, UV light in general kills coronaviruses. Um, the studies out about this coronavirus don't suggest anything different. We know that UV light in those type of situations, um, such as clinics, some, some people will have UV lights. Those are really uh, helpful in uh, decreasing amounts of bacteria, including things like tuberculosis. You know. I don't know that people just walking through the UV light, again, that's a very short amount of time, uh, but certainly for surfaces in that area, in the restaurant, if it's hit by the UV light, um, it will be very effective in killing it, but I certainly wouldn't use that as my only measure, and I don't believe that's the only measure. We do also, UV light has been used to decontaminate surfaces in the hospital as well as mass, so it's very effective. In that setting, um, I don't think it's really effective in protecting 
other people so much. It's certainly no um, no harm, but it may um, decrease the the amount of virus uh, on surfaces. Yeah, the problem is, I mean, you're not going to get disinfected because technically Correct. you have to do it for for a yes. while in order to kill it. Right. It's not like I get a flash of UV light and everything's dead. Sense. That doesn't work. No. So yeah. Okay. KCUR has three questions. Has KU had N95 masks decontaminated with the Battelle decontamination systems obtained by the Kansas Health Department? I can tell you that what we use for our decontamination system was by a local company called Pathogen, and we've talked about them, and they have been very helpful to us and a very good partner to us. We continue to use them. I don't have the exact numbers of the N95s that we have um, shipped to them, but we do that on a regular basis because we are um, reusing our N95s in an effort to um, really uh, build up our PPE supply chain. So we are using them. We aren't using this Kansas um, State Health uh, company or, no. or method, but we do have a method and a partner that's really been helpful to us. They've done a great job. So that's why we haven't used KDHE, right. is because we have it and it's already working for us. Good. That was question two and three. So now we'll move on okay. to KSHB. And they wanted to know if you can debunk these three things that they believe are myths that masks are bad for your health and can lead to carbon dioxide poisoning. We, True can, or debu false? we can totally yeah. de debunk that. Both of those statements are false. They are not bad for your health. They're good for everybody else's health. And they do not lead to CO2 poisoning unless you have really severe emphysema yes. and COPD. That's the only time it might cause some trouble. And even then, it's unlikely. And the reason it's unlikely is because carbon dioxide diffuses easily through stuff. It's not hard. And otherwise, you couldn't even breathe. Like, think about this. You can breathe in oxygen, and oxygen actually diff doesn't diffuse as well as carbon dioxide. So if you can breathe in oxygen through a mask, the carbon dioxide mm -hmm. going out yeah. goes out really easily. Now, again, if you have really severe lung disease, we have this thing called FEV1, how much air you can move in and out in one second. If your FEV1 is running around 20% predicted, you're going to have a hard time wearing masks. That means your lung function is about 20% of what it should be. Yeah, you probably have a hard yeah. time wearing a mask. And, you know, we always go back to our healthcare workers. We have our surgeons who do extremely complex surgeries right. for they're four, five, six, eight hours at 12, a time. 20. I mean, they're, they're in for the longest time. In an N95 mask. Yeah. And, you know, that's that doesn't even uh, allow as freely readable, um, you know, gas exchange around the sides, such as a cloth mask or a surgical mask, and they do fine. So, you know, I saw something, there was a mandate um, in, a, in a county in Florida about wearing masks in public, which I think is very proactive and very good. And there were people complaining to the board and to the, the physicians that it's masks are killing people and things of that nature. And it's really just unfortunate. Um, but hopefully we yeah, can continue to- And it's made up. Right. That's the part that right. it's just made up. So it's kind of like this. I go out, and I hit my head on a brick wall 22 times, and my head hurts. And then I blame the brick wall. Really? What do you think? Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? It is not the wall. This disease is real, and it protects others if you yes. wear a mask. And the point of not spreading the disease is to help save lives and help um, people from being so sick. So really, it's kind of like if you hit your head on the brick wall 22 times, whose fault is it? Is it the walls or is it yours? If you don't wear a mask and somebody gets sick, whose fault is it? It's your fault. And that's the problem with this disease. You know, we can have a lot more freedom in society if you'll wear a mask and if you'll behave. Mm -hmm. If people don't use personal responsibility, what is the outcome? The outcome is what you're seeing in Houston, Texas right now, yeah. in Florida right now. You're seeing it in Dallas, Texas right now. You're seeing it in Arizona. You're seeing it in Alabama. You don't want to see it here in Kansas City. Be responsible. Yeah, is it normal? No. no. Right? Well, actually, being responsible probably should be normal. <laughs> but is the COVID crisis normal? No. No, it's not normal. But you can make an adaptation to keep you and your loved ones and our society safe. And it is by social distancing, number mm -hmm. one. That is still the single most important thing you're going to do, is to stay at least six feet apart. And the second most important thing you're going to do is wear the darn mask. And mm -hmm. the third thing is to wash your hands. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. And if we can commit to that, we can control the disease. Yeah. You have to avoid a large public gathering. When you bring a lot of people into your home or you go to your bar and you, get, you have a little bit of drink and you get a little happy and you're kind of up against other folks and you don't have a mask on, you know what? There's a really good chance you're going to get it. And, Dana, interesting stuff coming out of CDC right now that says 8 to 10% not two or three percent, eight to ten percent of America either has yeah. or has had yeah. the virus based on antibody testing. Yeah. So the numbers are going up. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Myth number two, wearing a cloth mask doesn't protect me. No. Well, it may protect you a little bit, but it clearly yes. protects others from you. And what you want to see are the people around you wearing masks, because if they wear a mask, you're protected. That's the th yeah. You've got to keep saying that. And I think that's a great question because we get the mask questions all the time. The main goal of the cloth mask, again, not in a healthcare setting, not a surgical mask or an N95 mask, is to protect other people if you are expelling virus in your uh, cough, your sneezes, your secretions when you're talking. Now, there have been studies on cloth masks compared to surgical masks. They can offer anywhere from 40 to 80 percent protection of what a, just a typical surgical mask does. Um, so it will offer you some modicum of protection, but again, that has not been our main point as to why you should wear a mask. You should wear a mask because we have also seen that many people can be asymptomatic or presymptomatic and not even know they have the disease. So the main goal of the mask is to help spreading it to other people. You will get some benefit of a little bit of protection from the cloth mask if you're wearing it, though. And you and I don't have masks on right now because we're 10 feet apart. Right. Right? And if we weren't, you and I would have masks on. Absolutely. And when we walk out of this room, we'll have masks on. And we will wear masks the entire day. And yeah. then when we get back in the studio, well, I won't be back in the studio next week, but hopefully when yeah. I do get back to the studio, we're going to be, uh, we'll be spread apart and we won't wear a mask. Myth three, if I'm not sick, I don't need to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I think you just covered this. Yeah, that, that was, again, a great question. You know, um, even Dr. Fauci initially said, I would wear a mask if I was sick. The problem is with this virus, we know that you can shed high amounts of virus one to two days prior and really high amounts one to two days after any symptoms and then it kind of goes down a little bit from there. So we don't always know when we're sick and that's the real problem with this disease compared to something like the original SARS where you were probably most infectious about seven days after getting a symptom. Um, so they were easily able to um, contain isolate, those people, yeah. isolate, do the contact tracing. This is much different in that, in that manner. And, and that's why you have to have the mask, because you're, again, protecting everyone around you right. and protecting the family that you live with in your home mm -hmm. and, and the people who you care about. I mean, there are people, you're in the bubble, and you can make this My wife and I don't wear a mask around each other, right? We're in a bubble together. That's just the thing we've decided to do. We're going to accept that risk. But when I go out in public, gosh darn it, I have a mask on. I stop and get gas. Man, my, ma ma my mask is on. I run into the filling station and grab some lifesavers. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a great phrase. Lifesavers. <laughs> I didn't do that intentionally. It just came out. And I wore a darn mask because yeah. it really and does yeah. save lives. Yeah. It's just all about that. So, All right. So we have new questions here, and you've got a pile I've got a pile of them here. But wow. first, maybe we should turn to Jess because I think she's got some questions that are coming in about the community blood bank. Because you would never yeah, stop yeah. eating. <laughs> So, Jess, I, I think you've got some more questions about the blood bank. What's going on? How, what, what, what are you hearing out there? Okay, so, Dr. Stite, so I've got uh, Diane Newbecker here. She's with the Community Blood Center. And, um, Diane, so Angie says that um, her question is that the um, asking if the Community Blood Center is um, doing any sort of antibody testing. We are not doing that at this time. Um, there's considerable debate in the medical community about the test results. Okay, Georgie Ann wants to know, um, can a cancer survivor three years plus past active treatment give blood and also what types are needed? Well, it depends on the type of cancer. So she can call our main office at 816-968-4040 and she can ask that question. Types yeah. of blood? Types of blood, all types of blood. We especially like O neg because that's a universal, so they can give blood to anybody. O negative, right? O negative, yes. Okay. But all types are needed. Always. Okay. Noreen asks, how often can someone donate blood? Every 56 days for whole blood. We do have a procedure where we take, it's called double red cell donation. We take two units of blood, so that'd be 112 days. We reinfuse you back, your platelet plasma and saline. That procedure, uh, that blood is hospital ready, whereas a whole blood donation is, has to go through testing. Okay, so I donated a couple of days here with yeah. you. Was that, that, that was whole blood? That was whole blood. Okay, so kind of like your regular blood donation. Right. Okay, so Tawny wants to know, are there a variety, so we know that there's a variety of organizations uh, that collect blood, so how do I know which one to donate to? Well, Community Blood Center is the main supplier of blood for the Kansas City and surrounding areas. We service 60 plus hospitals, so it really is a local supplier of blood. Okay, good to know. And Debbie, last question. Um, can you give, we get a lot of questions about medications. Uh, Debbie wants to know, can you give blood if you're on blood thinners? No, you can't. 
Simple as that. Yeah. Well, and you said though, there's not a lot of things that keep you from getting blood. Right. Uh, but some medic, not all, but some medications will keep you. Correct. Right. And and when you come to register, we we pre-screen you. We ask you all the proper questions. But if you want to, again, there's 816-968-4040. If you have a question about it, they can answer it for you. Okay. And lastly, today's the last day. I just want yes. to remind everyone because you've had some really, really big numbers and a lot of new donors. So right. that is very encouraging. Uh, just lastly, tell everyone if they want to come down, where do they come? here on campus and how do they come down and donate blood? It's at the Health Education Building and it's B102 and um, we're right across from the hospital. We're in the um, medical school side. So we have a sign out there so you can see it and just come on down and we'd love to have you. All right, thanks so much, Diane. We appreciate it. Dr. Seitz, I donated a couple days ago, like I said, and it was really quick, it was really easy. It was not scary and most importantly, it was really, really safe. So everyone come on down and donate. It's much, much needed and such a great way to get back to the community. It is great, and thanks again, and so good to BKC and have people doing it. How many days blood supply do we have now? Yes, can you ask her how many days blood supply we have? What are we up to? Oh. Hey, Diane, really quick question from Dr. Stein. Supply right now, right now as, far as, as far as days, days go. go. It's, it's below, below three days. days. We like seven days inventory. It's one of the lowest levels we've had in the history of Community Blood Center. So we really, really do need people to come out and help. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stites? So we still got a lot of blood to give. That was pretty right. good. We still got a lot of blood to give, and we want you to <laughs> keep do. right on giving it. That's right. Okay, so we have questions this morning that are coming in, and they, it, they're really around schools. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, they're talking about, I have 20 or 30 students, I'm <laughs> secondary versus I'm a high school. What general advice do we have? And I do want to point out that in a couple of weeks, we're going to dedicate the whole week in bringing in experts. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of school folks come yeah. in and talk about this thing with us, I think, Dana. Yeah. But Dana, yeah. what do you think about going back to school? What's the good word? So there are very, there's a lot of aspects to this. There really are. Obviously. I've got some questions here we're going to hit uh, that'll help us um, illustrate those different aspects. Yeah, there is guidance on the CDC for really, you know, what to do, how to uh, really decrease the risk as much as possible. And those things include everything that we've been talking about. If you can spread the, the students out six feet or more, you know, if you can have them wearing a mask, obviously for older um, students, it's going to be a lot easier than younger students. The teachers really should have the masks on. They are probably going to be in, in higher risk areas. So if you can do those types of things, have adequate hand sanitizer available. Um, if you can keep all the students in the same room, obviously for things like high school and middle school, that's going to be a little bit difficult because they go through, through different classes during the daily um, routine. If you can do those things, have disinfected so everybody can clean off their desks prior, you know, when they come in and sit down and when they leave, things of that nature. Um, I think, however, you know, a lot of students really need to be in that um, environment to have that learning because I think a lot of learning dropped off this past uh, semester when, when they weren't in school, when they didn't have that direction. You know, it's hard for, for little children. It's easier as you're in college and you're doing self, really self-directed education to, to go to your classes. Um, but, but for younger children, even up to high school, sometimes it can be difficult and they need that direction given to them. So there are a lot of aspects in that, but certainly there are things you can do physically to mitigate the risk as much as possible in the classroom. You know, it's, but it's tough because some people have challenges at home. What happens if somebody has an immunocompromised person or they're immunocompromised mm -hmm. and they send their kids to school, I wonder? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the schools may continue to offer virtual learning. I think that will be very important moving forward, something like telehealth but more for the whole class. And if you can get to on-site in the school sometimes for some classes, if it's needed more than others, do that. Obviously, um, staying away will reduce your risk as much as possible. Um, these are very specific cases, and, and everybody and has to. I think to, in those cases, you really have to talk to your primary care physician right. because there's so many things we don't understand about that. So if somebody says, oh, I'm immunocompromised, or, my, or another question that came in was about, I have, my child has asthma, or my other child has cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. there's just a lot, of, yeah. a lot of individual pieces of that that you really need to have in order to fit that whole puzzle together. Yeah. What I would say is this. The more illness in your home, the higher the risk, right? That, that we know pretty simply. And I think what you have to try and do is sit back and say, okay, what's in my bubble? How much risk am I willing to take? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then what, is, what do I think I should do best? And kind of use your gut feeling. Do a good gut check on this. You know, the, the pandemic is really hard. 
we we all just have to be honest with that. And look, yeah. you know, I would love to be able to run out to the restaurant and have yeah. a drink, or not have to worry about who I socialize with and things like that. But that's that's just not where we are right now. And what I think people have to do is say the pandemic will pass. We are going to get a shot. We are going to get better therapy mm -hmm. for this virus, and we're we're going to end up okay. There are a lot of, there's a lot of sense, though, that I have to have an immediate answer. Do I send my kids to school? Do I not send right. them to school? Let me ask that question differently. What will keep you safe until we have therapy? Now, for some people, safety is such that they are having so many mental health challenges from having to shelter in place and be isolated. Safe means I'm going to take a little bit more risk. Mm. I had a patient yesterday in, in clinic, and he was saying that he and his wife are just really struggling. Um, mm -hmm. That they're, you know, bad lung disease. Obviously, if you're in my clinic, you probably have bad lung disease. Mm -hmm. and, and he and his wife are really struggling with this concept of having to stay at home yeah. so much. And it can lead to problems with increased drinking and domestic violence and different things. Those are, those are hard. If that's the story, you may have to take on a little bit more mm -hmm. risk. But let me flip that question out to one of our listeners who has a couple of children, but who's sick. Yeah. You, you want to get through that pandemic because those kids are going to need their mom forever, or at least for approximately a very long time. The pandemic is going to pass. You want to be here on the other side of that pandemic. So you have to make a decision about what keeps you safe. And how do you keep your kids safe around you? Because whether or not those kids stay safe is going to have something to do with how mm -hmm. safe you are. Mm -hmm. So those are two different answers, right? For one, I'd say, gosh, you're a mom. You need to be there for your kids. You compromise. I think there's a lot of good learning that going on. And this is temporary. For another couple, though, who's feeling like there's some mental health distress in the midst of the pandemic, the answer may be to go out and do a little bit more. They ain't gone to the grocery store. Well, let's go to the grocery store. Do things on both of those occasions, but because both of those answers are really the same answer. You gotta do something that's gonna keep you safe. You know, Dana, if you really think about this, people have been saying we're gonna have a vaccine for in 12 to 18 months, and mm -hmm. right now, the clock really started in Wuhan in mm -hmm. December, mm -hmm. maybe even in November. Yeah, yeah. And in the United States, it really started probably in December and January. And people were beginning to work on a vaccine back then. Mm -hmm. It's almost July. Yeah. Well, if it was 12 months to a vaccine, it means we're halfway there, right? We could be halfway there. And we've already gotten through the first half. Let's get through the second half. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I think we have, to, we have cause to be optimistic. We have to temper it. We have to do it with a dose of realism. And we have to do it with a lot of thoughtful reflection and just being honest about how things are going to go and how we're going to stay safe. Allie is a school nurse, and she says, how is this not going to spread? I want to go back. I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how is it not going to spread? Yeah. Well, we know the answer to that, I think. It's not. It is spreading. It's going it to spread. It continues to spread. That's just what this does. Again, it's, it's clinical um, efficiency in spreading, um, partly for, for many reasons, partly because, um, you know, the virus itself, partly because people don't even know they're ill and they're spreading it. Um, partly because of, of our human actions and what we're doing to not prevent the spread. So it is continuing to spread. Uh, but getting back to school is going to be important. Getting back to um, work has been important for a lot of people. Getting back to areas of higher learning, high schools, um, colleges, getting back to elementary schools and middle schools, that is all going to be important. And we have to continue to look at the data. And I know that's hard. We have to continue to um, look two weeks ahead, four weeks ahead, look back two weeks, four weeks, really assimilate all that data and really try to make the best decisions that we can make in that point in time. And if you wear a mask, yeah. <laughs> and you make sure you wash your hands and you stay six foot distance away, uh, you can keep yourself a lot safer. Now, as a school nurse, that's hard to do. You're going to be in close contact. Right. But if they have a mask and you have a mask, yeah. the likelihood of spread drops dramatically. You know, you, you go back to the uh, hair salons down in Springfield mm -hmm. where they had, I think it was 140 total exposures. Yeah, at least. Yeah. And both the, the client and the hairdresser had a mask on. And in 140 exposures, zero transmissions. 
Why? So wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Masks yeah. work. And what disappoints me sometimes is that we have politicized a health issue. And that's just wrong. The right thing to do is to keep yourself and your loved ones and everybody else safe. The pandemic is not forever. So we make a sacrifice in the short run to keep people safe. And then these stories spring up about masks not working. Well, really? Why do you think physicians yeah. always wear masks? Why do you think we always wear a mask in the operating room? Let, this is my other story. Let's just ask this question. You're having open heart surgery. The cardiothoracic surgeon is there. He's cutting your chest open. It pulls it apart. He's in there. He's got his face down. He's looking. He's taking your organs out. Do you really want him spitting in your chest? Is that what you want? Because that's what would happen without a mask. And he probably doesn't even have coronavirus, or she doesn't have right. coronavirus. But imagine if he did. So if it's not safe to have open heart surgery with a surgeon who doesn't wear a mask, right. why do you want to go out and not wear a mask? I don't get it. This is really elementary. And in a lot of those situations, too, we have to understand it. In the office situation, if you can um, consciously make an effort to maintain six, eight, ten feet apart um, in the school nurses area, if, if, you ha if you're seeing a, a patient or a student, maintain six to eight to ten feet apart. Our physicians do it all the time, maintaining six to eight, ten feet apart, except when we're having to examine the patient and be up close to them. So if you can really decrease that time of close contact, that is important as well. And you know what? It's not that hard to do. You take the mask, you put it on, there we go. Wait, 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 there we go, like that. I'll grab a little hand sanitizer right here. Of course, I didn't quite get it on, right? And then I sanitize my hands up. Yeah. Doing pretty good so far. And then I reach into my pocket, and looky here, right from Amazon, you can always get them <laughs> down at Lowe's and Home Depot. Yep. And you know what I'm going to do like this? I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you in my clinic, and this is what we do, mm -hmm. and we do it every single patient. And you know why we do it? Because we want to keep you safe. We want to keep you safe. That's what you need to do for everybody else. Next question. Glenn wants to know, are there any 100% accurate antibody tests available? Oh, man, 100% is a high threshold, data. Yeah, I'm not sure there's any 100% tests available for really just about anything. Um, so the answer to that is no. We have gotten better sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predi predictive value. Those are all statistical terms. Basically, they mean the test is good or the test is bad. Um, those also depend on the prevalence rate of the disease or how many people have been infected with the disease as well. So we, um, our, our Dr. Leesman and Dr. Plapp, our lab directors, have really done a lot to validate um, appropriate antibody tests. We have antibody tests now here at the health system, uh, but there's no nothing that is 100% for that test. Yeah, and what we do know is that when we started doing those antibody tests, they work well, but it's like 99.5%. Yeah. The problem is yeah. that if you don't have a very high uh, pretest probability of having the disease, the likelihood of getting a false uh, negative is getting gets pretty right high. up there. Get yeah, a, even a false high. positive gets yep. up there pretty high. So, yeah. Laura and Rita are asking questions about church. They want mm -hmm. to know advice on opening. Laura's getting a lot of pressure for her church to reopen that she goes to. Rita says, if we go, we'll be the only ones wearing masks yeah. because she can see it online and nobody's doing it. it are they safe? Yeah. Yeah, no. Th that's very dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you would think of all the places that would want to honor yeah. the principle of doing to others as you would have them doing to you, et cetera. Right. He, th th this would be one way to do it. But I think there was this sense that maybe um, a church can protect you from the coronavirus. But we know just from the data, just from the evidence, that the coronavirus doesn't really care if you're in church. I like going to church. I'm in, I am I do Zoom church every darn Sunday. Mm -hmm. In fact, my wife does it three times a week. and she try, I, Sometimes I'm pretty good about going with her. Um, and I think that you, you have to understand that the virus is with us, mm -hmm. and it travels with us when we go somewhere. And going into church will not protect you from the virus. Being around other people is a way of getting the virus if you're really close. And, and that's why we keep stressing this thing about social distancing and wearing a mask. You can go to church, but you've got to be distanced. You've got to wear a mask, and I wouldn't get anywhere near a choir. It no. is really clear right. that choir spread this disease. You know, I'm a com community uh, Christian church. Shanna Stice, our minister, does a great job. Uh, we're still in Zoom church. Mm -hmm. We have a, a little bit older congregation, and yeah. you know what? It's not right to bring them back yet. Yep. 
No, and I, I agree with that. I think if you can decrease singing in those areas, um, you know, really try to decrease the amount of time in that, um, in that gathering space as well. Bring your own hand sanitizer or have it available through the, the church itself, the congregation. Doing those things will help. But I think if, if other members, and especially if a lot of other members, are not wearing masks, that makes it a very dangerous proposition. And I would probably continue to hold back or maybe find another church that is more, um, the culture is more about wearing the masks. You know, Dana, one of the questions we also have is that it's pretty hard to keep distancing from family. Mm -hmm. What do you think about going to see those 80-something parents or grandparents? Yeah, I think we, we need to see our loved ones, I think, for everybody's uh, benefit. Certainly, if you can do it outside, if, if you can do it outside, I know it's getting hot out now, but if you can do it outside and under shade, uh, maintain that six, eight, ten feet of distance. You know, I think giving a hug is going to be great. Continue to wear masks uh, if possible as well. Um, you don't know, you know, I don't know what their bubble is, or you, you should know what your bubble is and things of that nature. Um, we, we really address this question a lot with um, our nursing home patients, and so that's important because we don't want those loved ones to get it, but then the other patients as well. I think it can certainly be done, but do it in, in the fashion that we've been talking about. Continue to do those things that we've been talking about. And certainly outdoors is better. You know, you can spend time talking, you can give a hug, wearing masks is better, the hand hygiene is better, all of that stuff. You know, one of my patients is a CF patient and her dad had some lung disease and, and uh, uh, had a transplant. And, and the, one of the questions is, can they get together? And my answer is, you know, if you both are wearing masks mm -hmm. and you're outside and you stay 6, 12, or mm -hmm. really, in this case, even a little bit, you know, 10 or 12 feet apart, yep. you just distance a little bit and you can keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. People say, well, I can't see anybody. Well, yeah, you can see people. Yeah. You just can't go inside and sit next to each other on the couch. You just got to be a little more distance. You know, my daughter was over last night. She just kept her distance. And, yeah. and we ate dinner together on the back porch. It was great. And uh, I think, you know, that's, that's how you look at this world right mm -hmm. now. It's different, but it can still be good. It's not what you're used to. And again, I'm, cross your fingers, I'm pretty hopeful. We're about halfway home. So don't let corona win. Don't let it win. Beat the darn virus, and the way you beat it, wearing a mask, wash your hands, keep your distance, don't touch your face, don't go yeah. out when you're sick. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds familiar. Stacy works in a small office, about 9 by 15, with poor circulation. Mm -hmm. She wants to know what are some protocols for her and safety. Also, where to maybe find them? Probably KDHE website or CDC. Uh, you can Google it, CDC and KDHE. CDC, yeah. KDHE has some really good stuff. And just a shout out to KDHE. They've done a great job maintaining their website throughout mm -hmm. the, the crisis. Yeah, they've continued to update it. You know, we, we have this uh, here at the health system, and we require everybody to wear masks. And the, the issue is, um, even in the offices, people are wearing masks because you don't know who will be coming by and sitting to have a conversation. Um, so we really, you know, masks are going to be important in those settings as well. Same with hand hygiene. Um, if you can really control who is coming around, then you maybe don't have to wear a mask. But a lot of times in an office setting, people are walking by all the time having conversations. So it's really difficult in that sense. So I think mask, again, is going to be important for everybody in that office setting. You know, Dana, especially in an office setting, there are going to be younger people. And as we talked about earlier in the show, we know that younger people are starting to get hospitalized. Why mm -hmm. do we think that that's the case? You know, I, I think that you know, we understand and we have said this. 85% of people are never going to have to seek medical attention when they get COVID-19. That, that other small percentage may have to go to the hospital and get supplemental oxygen to help them breathe. That even smaller subset of population is going to get critical illness and need a ventilator. While those are small percentages, if we are saying that this virus infects very efficiently and infects large numbers of people, those small percentages become pretty large numbers. And that's what we're seeing here now. Um, we just don't know, you know, even though you're young, your chance of getting critical illness is lower, but we know what happens. We see it in our hospital. We see it in the media stories. So it does happen. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but again, when you have so many infections, and now like you said, the CDC estimates that there's maybe 20 million people that have been infected, not the 2.2 million that they have put on their website. So that just um, lends you to see the easy spread of this virus and really how many people could have had it. When you have that many people, those small percentages do become significant numbers. You know, it's, it's um, 
It's really all about the odds, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when the virus first got here, it, it arrived in all around, but it really got into nursing homes. And that was what led to a yeah. lot of the original spikes throughout our community. Then as nursing homes really stepped up their game and did a great job, and healthcare agencies in general did, um, we, we still see some outbreaks in nursing mm -hmm. homes. There is no question about that. The, there's an increased census up north at Liberty and North Kansas City a bit, and a lot of that's from a nursing home outbreak, mm -hmm. or nursing home outbreaks. Um, but what we also know is that the predominant people who went out into society and got get together are the 20 to 30 year olds, mm -hmm. and to some degree the 30 and 40 year olds. Well, guess what happened to the hospital census then? Now it looks like that. Yeah. The second thing we know is that folks who are younger tend to be here less. Mm -hmm. So our average length of stay has dropped from 13 and a half to seven and a half days. However, we still have had 25 deaths. And those 25 deaths have occurred in every decade yeah. of, of life. So don't gamble. Don't keep hitting your head on the wall. Because it's not the wall's fault. That it hurts. You can control the spread of this disease. And everybody wants that special pill or the special mm -hmm. shot, and we all do. Well, that's what we do in medicine, that's, that's what we want. But until we have that special stuff, we need you. And you hold the power. And that's the remarkable part mm -hmm. about this. You do hold the power. And if you'll follow the, 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 the recommendations, you're gonna be okay. And that's the strategy right yeah. now, right? That's the strategy. Time for one more question. Erin wants to take her daughter to Chicago to see the School of Art where she thinks she may want to go to school. How do we do that safely? I would say drive. Um, I believe that the airports and the flights are really quite a bit more packed than, say, yeah, two or three yeah. weeks ago with travel. So driving is best. You know, I know there's a train. I would be really not wanting to go on the train or the bus up to Chicago. I think driving is best. And continue to do those safe practices. Make sure you have masks, make sure you have available hand sanitizer, and you can make it safe. Don't eat in restaurants, you know, just get takeout or drive through if you're staying at, at hotels or anything like that. I think it can be done safely. Um, certainly much more safe than, say, flight, train, or bus, or anything of that nature. So Dana, final thoughts from today? Yeah. You know, again, we are going into the weekend. Um, people are going to want to decompress and enjoy the weekend. Um, hopefully it will be done outside and physically distanced. Um, you know, if you are going, we really need to change the culture here in Kansas City, such as we saw in Colorado. A lot of mask wearing, a lot of hand sanitizer. That's going to keep everybody safe. Um, it's, it is difficult. We need to continue to um, talk about our message. Um, but we have to understand the masks are consideration for other people, consideration for people we don't even know. And so that's very important. And, and make sure if we are going into places of business, wherever, those places of business, you know, majority of the patrons are going to be wearing masks. The workers are going to be wearing masks. There's plenty of hand sanitizer because we really want to keep everybody safe so that we can continue, continue to go to those places and continue to have our economy on the upswing and not have people have to um, be laid off again and not be able to feed their family. So if we can do those things, I think that's the most important. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to be driving to Colorado um, beginning tonight, I hope, Yeah, uh, get out of work today. But the, um, the goal is to stay safe while traveling. Time to get out of town, mm -hmm. time to go do a little fishing and go out and, 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 and spend a lot of time in the woods and on the river. Um, pack the food, it's already in the cooler. Yeah. Right? Got my hand sanitizer, got the mask. My wife and I are going out there. We'll drive out. We are going to stay in a hotel, but uh, we're going to be eating our meals on the river together. Mm -hmm. And then we will um, um, prepare some meals right there in, in the hotel. And again, you can do really cool stuff. We may order out a few things and bring it in. Um, I think it'll be safe. Yeah. And I think we know how to do that. And you know what? You know how to do it, too. You know how to do it. And you just have to remember that there is fake news and people out there who are not telling you the right stuff. When you, when you have that doubt, just think, how do physicians act? How do nurses act? How do we do that when we're here in the hospital? When you're sick or when you're compromised by illness, people are going to come in, they're going to have a mask on, they're going to have gloves on, they're going to be washing their hands constantly. And why do we do that? And why have we done that for generations? Because it keeps you safe. Before that, think about that, in the, before we had hand washing and all these things, 
there's a really high mortality rate from surgery mm -hmm. and things like that, largely due to infection, but it's not there anymore. And why is that? Because of the pillars of infection control yeah. have allowed us to keep folks safe. Those pillars keep you safe when you're here, and they will keep you and your family safe wherever you go. So don't make it a political issue. Make it a health issue, because that's really what it is, and it keeps you safe when you do it. Well, we'll be back next week, or yes, you'll be back next be week. Back. Jessica Lavelle will be here in the studio. I'll see you the following week. Fourth of July is coming up. Have a great weekend. And remember, until we meet again, there's still no place like home. Stay safe out there.